All right. Welcome, Anchor Church. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you to our worship team for leading us in, uh, in song and leading us to worship. And really grateful to them uh, this morning for that. Grateful to see you this morning. Glad that you're here with us. Uh, see some many familiar faces, a couple of new faces, like Greg, our host, said uh, first visitors and even second time visitors. It's the second time visitors, you know, that, that really, really count because uh, that means that at least the first visit wasn't so bad that you didn't want to check it out a second time. Uh, and I'm only kidding. If you're a first time or second time, as the host mentioned, we're just glad that you're here. Glad that you're worshiping with us today. And I'll uh, want to just make a note that if you had questions or, or wanted some information, I'll be in the lobby, but our connections table and those uh, connections coordinators, concierge table, they can answer all of your questions as well, as well as whoever may have invited you here. So just want you to know you've got access to us and, and would love to catch up with you. Are you guys ready to dig into the word today? Yes. Yeah, well, before we dig into the word, uh, I, I had a thought while Sarah was talking and praying, she had mentioned just the gift of the son, uh, the gift of God's son to us. And then it, it prompted the, the immediate thought that there was the gift of the spirit, because I was talking a little bit about the spirit being a gift to us. Uh, and then today I was going to talk about walking in faith, walking by faith, and a little bit about what that means and the, uh, the need for dependence upon the Spirit. So I was thinking about the gift of the Spirit, and then she said the gift of the Son, and then I thought, well, that sounds almost Trinitarian. And then I thought about, I immediately thought of 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Um, so this is the sermon before the sermon that is completely unrelated, but maybe it would encourage you today. In, in um, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, uh, you'll have to just forgive my King James. I've just memorized everything in King James. Behold, what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the children of God. Um, and the thought is, look, look at what, can't you see, uh, what kind of love that the Father has given us that we, this love would have it such that we are called and we are the children of God. So we have the gift of God as Father. That's a gift. To have him as your Father is a gift. But the gift of his love then John 3, 16, he gave his only begotten son, so the gift of his son. And then, of course, we know from numerous passages of Scripture, we have the gift of the Spirit. So how do you even describe what that is? Uh, you know, I almost need to, I, 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 can, I, I, only, I have to let it be the sermon before the sermon. I'm not ready to develop that thought just yet because it's so rich. The Trinitarian God has given himself to us. And there is no greater gift than to, to have and know him as God, but to know him as father, to know the son and to have been given the son and then to know the spirit and to have been given the spirit. It's just too, too much. It's too good. Anyway, I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe the thought there is that um, there might be some of us that feel like going to church. And maybe if I, if I give in to this whole thing about going to church, if I give in and become a member of this church, which we don't really put any pressure on anyone to do that. I'm just saying there might be some, some, some uh, fork in the road, crossroad moments where we're like, man, I want to follow God, but I haven't taken a step of faith yet. Or I've been following God and I like this church, but I don't know. I only know a couple of people so far. And maybe you're thinking, maybe I should join a group or a serving team or join the church, or maybe just commit to following Jesus with my life. Just trust him, just take a step of faith. A lot of times what's holding us back is the sense that there's, uh, th 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 that uh, you know, God might wanna take things from us in doing that. Like if I go all in here and make a commitment, maybe God will take things from me. Maybe, maybe I'll lose some autonomy there. Maybe I'll lose uh, you know, my reputation. Maybe I'll lose whatever. And when I think about the gifts that I just described, God only wants to give. I think maybe the misrepresentation of God comes to us through, you know, preachers and pastors and churches and other religious things, you know, where, where maybe it feels like all they ever do is ask and all they ever do is take and all they ever uh, have is need, whereas God is so much different than that. And so that's how I hope he's portrayed through our church and ministry. And I hope to be able to do that as well is to convey that God only wants to give the gift of the father to call you his children. He wants to give you his love. Look what manner of love this is. Look at the son. He gives us his son. He gives us the spirit. What is there that he would ask from us that would be anything greater than the gifts he has given us? So there really is nothing to take. It's only what God wants to give. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the beauty of the good news of Jesus. So sermon before the sermon. How was that? Yeah, that's all right. Okay. Well, I'm done. I guess it's... 
Now, now I just got to cut the actual sermon I have down to size, um, which you guys be happy about anyways. Um, well, let me just pray. I'm going to settle my soul and ask the Lord to just redirect our thoughts. Lord, I, I just thank you for a chance to share good news. And, and the good news is just the gift. And I was prompted by that thought as Sarah was leading us today. Thank you for what, what a minister of the gospel that she is, and, and also just for our whole worship team and, and our teaching team and even our partners. There's so many of our members of this church who could just as easily stand as I did just now and share the good news as I did just now. I'm so grateful for this church, this body of believers, so many of them who are firmly planted in the gospel. And I just pray, God, that we would be a people of joy, a people of gift giving, people who would transition from uh, 12-year-olds who need from parents to uh, 30 and 40 and 50-year-olds who are secure in the gospel and who have resources to give, even if it's just the good news, like Peter said. I don't have silver and gold. I just give you this in the name of Jesus. And so I pray we would be those kinds of people whose mind shift, mindset shifts and attitudes shift to be more like you, God, the gift-giving Father who gave us his love, You've given us your son. You've given us your spirit. And so, Lord, I pray that we, in receiving, would be the kind of people who, in turn, can give and have the giver's mindset toward the people we encounter this week. And so, Lord, I pray even now as we redirect our thoughts that you would help us to know how you're leading us. I uh, want to share, but I need your help, Lord, in terms of how to walk by faith and what that means. And, Lord, I know that each of us may have different uh, desires. We may have different, uh, different set of decisions that we're up against that we need to make. There, there could be any number of challenges that we're facing. And so, Lord, I pray that you would take the one set of uh, words I have, but that you would turn them into the hundreds of words that these people need. And so, Lord, I pray that you would minister to us through your spirit, make the one message <clears throat> specific and tailored through your spirit, to the needs and hearts of everyone listening, either in this room or even online. So Lord, please just minister to us. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, today I wanna talk a little bit, as I've mentioned, about just what it means to walk by faith. And one of the uh, issues we have with with walking by faith is, and and even other terms like that, is we don't exactly know what they mean. There's not a general consensus on what those things mean because when I say walk by faith, it could, it could actually mean a few different things depending on you know, what your background is or how you've come to understand what that means. And so when we use things like faith or other words uh, like that, they almost have a religious overtone, a religious connotation. And I don't mean to say that negatively, it just sounds like it, it pertains to something spiritual or religious or something like that. So it could be difficult really to understand what it means to walk by faith. And so um, I, I kind of want us to understand that walking by faith l- means to, to live in such a way um, and to operate in such a way or to have the mindset and attitude of trust with God. To live by faith is simply to trust him. And, uh, and I think that that's maybe language that we can understand. And, and actually in, in the Greek, which, you know, I'm not a super expert or whatever, but in the Greek, um, the word faith is, uh, is the same word as trust. It's also the same word as believe. So all of those words, you know, have the, they, uh, you know, they all have the same root word, if you will. And so they're connected in a way. So when I say, hey, you need to have faith, um, you know, who knows what that means? And, and I think it means that you need to believe. And then even then, like, what does that mean? Well, you're going to have to trust God. And so I think for us, that's a, that's a challenge in terms of walking by faith. And I want to navigate that for us. Now, <clears throat> as we walk by faith, the, the, the real issue for us is not just that we need to know things. So a lot of times as we're uh, facing a decision or facing a crisis or a challenge in our life, we feel like if we could just understand it better, then we'd be able to sort of walk by faith. But that, that sort of betrays the concept of what trust is um, in a way. Now, in order to trust someone, there are some things you need to be able to know, but you only know those things on the basis of a pattern of behavior. So you'd say, I don't trust you uh, to you know, stay home and not watch Netflix, why? Because every time you, I leave you at home to babysit the kids, you watch Netflix instead, you know, something like that, okay? So there's a pattern. There are some things you have to know, but trust at the end of it really is a step of faith or a step of trust, if you will, that 
that, uh, that you will do what I know or think you will do. And that's difficult in relationship to God. Um, I think for us, the, the, it really does just come down to us not receiving any sort of guarantee that the decision we make is gonna turn out to what we perceive to be our benefit. So like if I take this job and if we move our family, then I just need to know that everything's gonna work out and it doesn't operate that way. So trust essentially is, is uh, not knowing the future and then depending on the one who does know the future. So it is more relational. It's more relational than it is um, informational. I can't just get up here and give you information that's gonna help you make your decision. I can only describe what type of relationship God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit wants to have with you. And that as you do the best you can to count the cost in whatever uh, decision you're up against, as you do the best you can to count the cost for that, you have to lean into God relationally and trust that he will help to guide your steps. Now, there's a few ways that I've done that over time. And I wanna guide you into one way that I saw in the book of Acts. And there's a few things that I think uh, will help us today. So will you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 16? And this is one way. Acts chapter 16. My uh, conscience is bothering me a little bit because I see I have dear friends in the audience who might be contemplating, uh, you know, career and move and things like that. And so uh, that genuinely, uh, I'm not even, I'm just like looking this way, just saying, guys, I'm only speaking and not even thinking of anyone in particular, just that um, I I may know things about us as a church. And so I don't want any of us to think like, hey, he's picking on me today. Um, That's not the case. So Anyway, there could be so many types of decisions um, that, that we, we're, we're encountering as a church family. And I just want you to know I'm thinking of all of us and not picking on any of us. So, which will, will be fun to laugh about later this week with those friends. So Acts chapter 16. Uh, Acts chapter 16 says this. And uh, the reason I want to point this out is because Paul was in quite a dilemma. Now, <clears throat> I'm just going to read a little bit for you. <clears throat> It says uh, this in chapter 16, verse one, Paul went first to Derby and then to Lystra where there was a young disciple named Timothy. His mother was a Jewish believer, but his father was Greek. Timothy was well thought of by the believers in Lystra and Iconium. So Paul wanted him to join them on their journey. So they're on this missionary journey. In deference to the Jews of the area, he arranged for Timothy to be circumcised before they left for everyone knew that his father was a Greek. Then they went from town to town, instructing the believers to follow the decisions made by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in their faith and grew larger every day. Verse six, next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Now, they were trying to go into Asia And it says here that the Holy Spirit had prevented them from from doing that. And so I don't know what that looks like. That looks like trying to book a plane ticket and uh, and then realizing that the prices had had tripled in the last week since you looked at them. And I guess we're not going to Asia. That looks like uh, I thought we had this deal and I thought it was secure, but it all fell apart in the end. And it looks like uh, we were prevented from doing what we wanted to do. That looks like uh, we thought we were going to move. We thought we had this relationship. We thought this, we thought that. But for whatever reason, uh, whether it was financial, relational, health, even um, occupational, whatever, we thought we had it. It didn't work out or it didn't feel the way it felt a week ago. Things have changed since then. And a lot of times when we see those kinds of things play out, for us, it... Um, It it sort of feels like maybe we're losing something. It feels like maybe something's being taken away from us. We feel like it's hard to really square with why, you know, something seemingly terrible is happening or something bad or just things aren't going the way we wanted them to go. And the way that Paul understands it, and really this is Luke writing the book of Acts, but the way that Luke understood Paul and the way that the team understood it was that the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Verse seven, then coming 
to the borders of, My, of Mysia, they headed north for the province of Bithynia. But again, the spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. I don't know what that means. Just, you know, they don't tell us how the circumstances played out, but for whatever reason, as they were going in this direction, they were prevented from doing so. We've all been there before, again, in all of those areas of life. And, um, and, and what he, what they, the way they understand it is that the spirit is preventing them from heading in that direction. Now that's a better way of looking at opened doors and closed doors uh, than, than maybe thinking of them as just getting what I want, not getting what I want. Going the way I wanted, things going the way I wanted them to go, things not going the way I wanted them to go. And so the better way to look at opened doors and closed doors might be that this is the leading of God's spirit in our life. And so now when a door is closed in the direction that we were going, we would just sort of relinquish control over that situation and say, the spirit is preventing us from going in this direction and we don't know why. Now, on what basis would you attribute uh, goodness to God other than trust in that moment? Because you can't really see what he's up to. You don't know what he's doing. You don't know why you're being prevented. You don't always know why you're being prevented. You just know that you are. And in that moment, the only way to actually say, I don't know why, but I do know that God is good. And that is a step of faith. That is what it means to trust. Because essentially trust is sort of uh, the same way as you think of faith. It's almost like you can't see. So faith is uh, believing in something you can't see, right? And trust is a little bit similar to that. It's, 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 um, it's leaning on something that you either don't understand or you, don't, uh, you, you, you can't see. And that's what it means to walk by faith, is to trust the things that we do know even when we're surrounded by things we can't see, don't understand, or don't know. So we wouldn't want to trade, you know, what, the, the, the things that we know for sure for the things that we don't know just because we're going through uh, a, a series of events where we're being prevented from what we want to do. So you don't want to trade the things you know. I know God is good. I know that he loves me. I know that he's with me. I know those things because the scriptures have, have, have taught me those things. Um, and because the community of faith is reminding me of those things and the spirit is confirming those things. He loves me, he's with me, he will not abandon me. I am his child, he is my father. He's given me his son, he's given me the spirit, all of those things. I can know those things and I'm not gonna give those things up and just deny all of that simply because there are a few other things I don't know. When I'm encountered with those situations, I don't know or I don't understand. I have to cling to the things I do know to get me through those seasons of, of not understanding, not knowing, not seeing. And that's the best I can, I can describe what it means to walk by faith, to trust. It's to cling to the things I do know that the scriptures have taught me while I go through something that I don't know, can't see, can't understand. And so I think for us, as we, as we, as we cling to that, it, it does make a difference. It doesn't necessarily uh, take us out of the pain or out of the season we're in or, or away from having to make a difficult decision. But what it does do is it settles the soul in a trust relationship with God that says, I can't see and I don't understand and I'm doing the best I can to count the cost, but I'm gonna take a step in this direction. And should we be prevented, not the first time, but even the second time, should we continue to be prevented from what it is we want or what it is we're pursuing, we will continue to trust you and say that the spirit has, is guiding us through that. The spirit is leading me. The spirit is helping me. And that I think for me sort of, it doesn't mean necessarily that there isn't any frustration or that there isn't any disappointment, a massive disappointment in my life. And from week to week, I'm, I'm half disappointed in myself most weeks. There's enough disappointment for sure. But what it does uh, for me is, is sort of, it, it allows me to square with the fact that I am not in control 
but that I am in a trust relationship with someone. I am trusting someone. I'm in a relationship with someone who is in control and I'm going to go ahead and just trust him. Trust him to help me, trust him to guide me. And it takes that pressure off of all the closed doors I've experienced in life and will experience for the rest of my life, just the same as all of us. When I experience a closed door, I cannot and don't want to react in such a way as to say, I'm not getting what I want and I'm upset about it. Some of us are gonna get angry. Some of us are gonna cry. Some of us are gonna worry. We're all gonna respond in various ways to those. And, and some of that's right. There's always, it's, it's, it's right to grieve uh, something that's disappointing. It didn't work out the way we thought. Ah, you know, grieve that. Just say, okay then. But then square that with the trust you have in God. And let your soul be settled, even if uneasy, but let it be settled that God is in control that he knows what's happening and that for whatever reason, knowing all the things he knows, this was best for me that I'd be prevented from whatever that was. That's what it means to trust. We kind of get it when it comes to relationship with, you know, friends or spouse or roommates or parents or something like that. Uh, But when it comes to God, I want us to think of him as someone we are in relationship with. And it's a trust-rooted relationship. So back to Acts chapter 16, <clears throat> that's what they do. They, they sort of indicate that it must have been the Spirit. And so then they keep pursuing. That's the other thing that I think is really good, is not to give up just because there's a closed door, but to keep pursuing God. It must be that he's leading us elsewhere. So in verse eight, instead, verse eight of chapter 16 in Acts, so instead they went on through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. It wasn't like I didn't get what I want. And so that's it. I'm giving up. I'm no longer following God. It didn't happen the way I wanted. And so I'm done. I'll just go do my own thing. Um, I don't know if anyone's on the verge of that, but, I, but what I'm saying is, you know, at, at some point, That's part of what it means to trust too, is to to continue leaning into the relationship, even when it seems like maybe you've been let down. I can think of a couple of bills in college that didn't get paid. I had to, uh, I I see a friend of mine that went to college and there's a couple of times that the the bill didn't get paid. And at the end of the semester, I had to go talk to the bursar and uh, and have have a conversation about paying that bill or working it off or whatever. But then God providing for me. um, And I always wondered if God, enjoyed paying late fees? Because if he was going to come through for me two weeks after the semester was over, why didn't he just provide two weeks before? God, you would have saved $39. His timing is just different. I don't get it. I don't know why he likes to pay late fees. He's got to trust him. There's been a number of times in my life I've been disappointed. We sing songs that say, I'll never be disappointed. You've never let me down. We sing to God like that. But, you know, there's a little bit of dissonance in my mind. Like, well, there was that one time that I really thought you were coming through for me. And he did. And he does in a different way. Like someone in the congregation uh, just said, he did. He does. It's in a different way. It's at a different time. Um, but here's, here's the catch though, is that a lot of times we're placing our trust in, in circumstances. In other words, I just really think and I'm leaning on this. If this comes through, it's really going to do this for me. And so then what happens in those moments is that when we are let down by circumstances, then we feel massively disappointed and it gets sort of transferred over to God. Like, I wanted this so bad and you didn't help me get it. And so, you know what? I'm actually mad at you now, or I'm upset with you now. When, if our expectation was firmly set on God, in other words, God, I just believe you want the best for me. I think this could be it. But even if it's not, I'm gonna trust that you know what's best and you'll guide me through opened and closed doors and and other ways through the spirit and the scriptures. But my hope is not set on this. In other words, I don't need this job to pay the bills. I just need whatever it is you're doing in my life to pay the bills. I don't need this relationship to feel uh, um, 
secure or whatever, or to feel satisfied or to feel uh, connected. I, I just need you, God. And so if this relationship doesn't work out, if this job doesn't work out, if, if for whatever reason I'm not you know, over this sickness within the next month or whatever, I'm just going to trust you, God, that through the circumstances of life that you're guiding everything, that you're still good no matter what, and my expectation is in you alone, that you will guide, you will provide, you will help, you will clarify. Then when something does fall through, when plans don't go according uh, to plan, is that how you say that? Plans don't go according to plan? When, when things do happen in a way that's different than we desired, we, we might be disappointed, but never really let down by God himself because we know he will provide, we know he will help take care of us, and we know that he's in control. And that's how, and that's the only way, how we would ever be able to sing to God with a clear conscience, you've never let me down. It's just that in those times where I th thought you let me down, I had really just placed my faith or I had placed trust in something other than you. But at the end of the day, every time that I've counted on you, I've never really been let down. Yeah. Even when circumstances didn't play out the way I thought. Because in those circumstances, I just trusted that you were good, that you had a plan, that you knew what you were doing, and that you loved me, and I could lean into that. That's the only way to sing those kind of songs. That's the only way to truly uh, walk in faith. So that's what, that's what Paul and these guys are doing, the whole team. They're just saying, okay, we were let down once. Let's try again. That didn't work out. It's the second time. Okay, so we're going to keep going, verse 8. Now, verse 9, that night Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And help us. Verse 10, so we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. That's so good. I love the way that's worded. Having concluded that that's where God wanted us to go. I, what I like about that, actually, if, if we could leave that verse up for just a second, what I like about that phrase is that we decided, based on a conclusion we came to, that God was calling us to preach the word. Now, of course, he had that vision. Um, but I, I, do, I do think that those closed doors, the series of closed doors they went through was all part of what they factored in to drawing this conclusion. We tried to go there, didn't work. Okay, the spirit must be leading us elsewhere. We tried this way, doesn't work. Okay, must be elsewhere. We're just gonna trust that God's leading us and he's using closed doors to lead us. We're going over here. There's a little bit of an open door towards Troas. As we start walking in that direction, we receive confirmation through a vision. It could, for me, a confirmation has come through friends. There's been a couple of points, significant turning points in my life where a friend spoke into my life and that, and that felt like confirmation as I was going in this direction. And so I concluded, it's just, it's almost human, isn't it? I just love that it's, it, it's written like a human wrote it. That just feels so re refreshing and relieving a little bit to me. Like, okay, uh, we decided having concluded. And that's the way it goes when you walk in faith. You're just taking all the data. You're doing the best you can. And then, uh, and then you, you wait on God and you receive some measure of confirmation from him. And you say, okay, I'm, I'm, I, I think I'm coming to the conclusion that this must be the way God wants us to go. And we just relinquish all control to God being the one who guides us, and he guides us sometimes through, you know, visions like Paul had. I don't know. There was one moment in my life where I did have what I felt like was a clear vision. It wasn't quite like, you know, the Macedonian call as Paul received. Um, but there, was, there, there have been times where he's led me that way. And then there have been times where he's led me through friends. There have been other times where he led me through scripture. I was reading the scriptures and a verse popped out at me, just stood out to me like, man, that is what God wants me to do right now. He wants me to trust him there or trust him this way. But there's been times where the scriptures have spoken to me. Um, and then there, there, have been, there have been times too where uh, the spirit, you know, just speaks to me almost not through a Bible verse or not through a friend, but just driving and, and having a realization or a thought of something. And all of these ways are the different ways that God's spirit can lead us. And so we conclude best we can that God must be leading this way. And church, what would happen if we concluded that it must be this way and that deal falls apart? We just keep moving in faith, leaning into the relationship. 
We just leaned a little too heavy on the, on, on the, you know, the promises that we, we thought were coming our way if this comes through. But we just say, okay, I concluded this. You know what? You don't, it's not even right or wrong. We just, there's so much guilt and so much uh, tension there, but it's not like I was wrong. How could I be so wrong? Just give all that up. Just stop doing all that. I didn't know. I'm not God. I can't see the future. We concluded. And so we went and that fell apart. And so then we concluded this and then that fell apart. And so we just keep moving, trusting God all the way through. That's how we live by faith. That's the best I can tell you. You know, I can't answer everybody's questions. I can't even resolve my own, you know, my own questions. I can't even tell you what next year looks like for me. I can only tell you, we have a God who loves us, who's given us, I mean, maybe that's how the, the first part ties into the first sermon, ties into the second one. We have a God who loves us, who's given us his love. He's called us his children. That's no small thing. He's given us his son, which, in, which comes with a huge benefits package. It comes with, with salvation. It comes with uh, an inheritance that you can never spend. You will never exhaust the inheritance you have. You know, it's just like a trust fund. You know, you're just, just going to get a little bit at 18. I'm not going to let you spend it all right now. I mean, you're going to get a little at 18, and then you'll get a little at 30, and then you get a little at 40, and you can have the rest at 65. How about that? You know, God knows how to lead his kids. He's got, we've got a huge, massive trust fund, an inheritance in Christ that he says, hey, I'll give you what you need when you need it. But just trust me, if I haven't given it, you don't need it. Just trust me. And in that posture, we can say, I've got everything I need. And then we just keep leaning into faith. And even now I'm getting like cry emotionally, just like, but when you don't have what you feel like you need, lean into your brothers and sisters. Get some encouragement. Lean into the scriptures, lean into the spirit. Let somebody help remind you that we've got a good God who loves us and can help us get through this. We can grieve together with those who are grieving and then we can rejoice together with those who are rejoicing. We can do all of this together while we learn to just Trust God. Oh, man. I sent like five verses to the slide team. We just went through the first one. <laughs> so we concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news. That's kind of how we've led too. You know, how I've led the church a lot of times is not like, uh, I, I really rarely, I don't, I can't even, I mean, some of you are charter members here, but I can't recall very many times playing the God card. Like no one argue about this. This is what God's telling us to do. And I just feel so strongly God is saying. Um, we just generally say as a leadership team, it seems to us that God is leading this way. We just use language like that. And actually in, in various versions of Acts chapter 16, uh, depending on how the translators word it, it will use the word seems. It seemed to us. And so that's kind of how we lead the church too. And that's how I want you to kind of that's the loose gr grasp I want you to have. It's confidence, but it's like loosely held where you say, it seems that God is leading this way. And what that conveys is I'm trusting God and I have this sense, this thing I've concluded, but a as I go through that, I'm gonna relinquish ultimate control to God. It seems this way. And what that does then I think is allow God room to navigate circumstances in our life. So that, so that um, we're not, you know, playing the God card. So we haven't done that a lot. I would try to shepherd our church in that direction, not to play the God card. Now, the only time uh, where I've seen that, you know, uh, well, I, I was going to joke about a guy saying to a girl, I feel like you're the one God told me you're, that we're supposed to get married. I, I, don't, I don't see that ha going for you very well, but I do remember in college... <laughs> I do remember in college that happening a few times and me just thinking, that was gutsy, man. You're, like, you're, you're 100% sure that God told you that's the girl. And then you told her, and then, but what if she's not sure, man? You like went out on a limb there. Well, uh, that's kind of how I feel about, that's a way of joking about it, but that's kind of how I feel too when we play that God card. There's just so many things I'm confident of, I just know, but I also say it seems. I'm leaning, I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to indicate some measure of trust. And, uh, and that's how I want us to lead others. And that's how I want us to surrender to God. And that's how I want us to convey this trust relationship we have with God. Well, there's a couple more things, but you know, uh, look at Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, this is, uh, they, were, they were having some real tension in Acts chapter 18. 
Uh, there were people opposing them. There were people uh, beating them. They had been thrown out of the city. And then uh, Paul is seriously contemplating moving on in verse 9 of chapter 18. It says, One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. So this seems to be a little bit of a pattern for Paul. And told him, Don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack and harm you. For many people in this city belong to me. Verse 11. So Paul stayed there for the next year and a half, teaching the word of God. Um, the, the passage here is that in the face of opposition, not just in the face of decisions, but even in the face of opposition, God was able to speak to him and say, trust me, stay here. There's more people for you to reach. There's more things for you to do here. And so Paul decides then uh, to stay and to minister having, having heard from God. And, and to me, I think what was interesting about that is just the, the phrase where, where God says, for many people in this city belong to me. Now, as a side note, that really helped me to understand um, the, the tension between man's responsibility or free will and God's election or predestination. It just helped me to understand that. That was a passage that made that clear. Now, that's not the main topic of my message, but as I understand it, and as you read it, uh, in other versions, it will say, uh, God, it says here that God said, for I have chosen many people in this city, or many people belong to me in this city. And the idea here is that we have no confidence that anyone would ever turn to God unless God himself worked in their life to open their eyes and bring them to himself. So in other words, if it's 100% free will, we have no confidence anyone will ever come to God. But if God says, hey, stay here, I'm not gonna tell you who they are, but I've got some people here and they're mine and I'm, and I'm coming for them, but I'm gonna use you to go get them. Then it's like, then I've got confidence. Don't know who they are and I don't know how many they are, but I've got confidence on this basis that God knows his and he calls them to himself at the right time. And I don't know any of that. I just know that it exists. I have the responsibility, the free will to say, then I will go and I will preach the gospel, no strings attached, because I don't know who you're calling. I don't know who are your people. I'm assuming all of them are your people and it will become evident as they come to faith, which are the ones you're calling. Nonetheless, the point here for me, the main point is this, that as Paul isn't sure what to do, and is under a lot of pressure and contemplating what direction they should go, God says, stay here, essentially, stay here. I have a plan. There's a plan at work. There are many people that belong to me in this city. I have a plan. I have a purpose. Now, Paul gets the benefit of seeing what that was. I don't always get the benefit of seeing what that is. Like, Chris, stay in Hampton Roads, plant this church, stay for, you know, 12 to 15 years and get this done. And then, and then I've got a plan for your life after that. There's so much in my life that I can't see the future. I don't know about. But I have to trust that even if God doesn't show me the way he showed Paul, the fact that it's in the scriptures is really less about like me having to do it the way Paul did it. Like, I'm not going to stay if you don't give me a vision the way you gave Paul a vision. That's not the point of that passage. The point of that passage is this. Even if God doesn't show me, what I learned from Paul is that when God gave Paul a behind the scenes look at what was going on, God revealed to Paul to teach me that he has a plan and it comes with a purpose and that I'm to follow God, even if I don't get the same privilege Paul got, which is looking a little bit ahead to see, oh, he's, he's, he's got a plan. I'm gonna stay here and work. I just have to trust that. I just have to trust. That's the beauty of the glimpse into Paul's visions that we get. Not that we always have the same kind or that it has to be the same way, but that we see behind the curtain a little bit. God has a plan. He has a purpose. And I can trust him in that. And I can continue to go in the direction we're going until the doors close or until something else changes. And even in that moment, at that juncture, I can continue to trust him. Have I beat this? Is this horse dead? <laughs> All right. Any questions? Great. Let's pray. Lord, help us. <clears throat> help us as we think about trusting you. There's a verse in my notes that I didn't preach from, but... I pray, God, that even as I quote it for us in my prayer, that you would, you would help us. Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart 
and lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. God, I pray today we would trust in you with all of our hearts, that we would not lean solely on our understanding, but that we would lean on you, that we would trust you and that you would free us from the, the waves of emotion and worry and anxiety that come when we are doing our best to try and lean on our own understanding. Free us from that, Lord, by helping us understand that even as we plan and prepare and make plans and count the cost, that, that we need to trust you. We need to lean on you, not just to guide us, but relationally, Lord, that each of us would lean on you as Father, generous and loving Father who wants the best for us. And that from, from that place, from that rooted place, God, that you would guide us into what you have for us. Each of us here is probably facing decisions or facing challenges and setbacks, or we know someone that is. And God, I pray that we would be a people that are wholeheartedly devoted to you leaning on you and not leaning on our own understanding. And Lord, we believe that in doing so, you will direct our paths. You will help us. And so Lord, we just place our trust in you. It's trust, Lord, and you know what kind of people we are, fragile, scared, weak. You know, you know our frame. I'm even thinking of a conversation last week after church with someone about just the fact that you know our frame, you know how weak we are, you know that we're made of dust, you know that we're scared, we're fearful, we, we have a hard time with trust. And you're like a good husband, a good father, or a good spouse, a good parent. You're so trustworthy that even, even at, the, at what could be a potential offense to you in that we don't trust or that we're having a hard time trusting, you love us the same. It doesn't offend you. You're so patient with our lack of trust, so patient, kind and generous, even in the midst of our doubt. And so God, I pray that your love would win us over and that in time we would grow into a people whose faith is becoming more secure, whose trust is growing and growing. And so Lord, I pray that you would use all that we as a church and all that we as individuals are going through to build our trust in you. The scriptures tell us that you're trustworthy. That's just not in question. I just pray, God, that we would come to a place where we believe that wholeheartedly. And I pray you guide us into that, even now, Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.